And we're live. Welcome back, everybody, to a new episode of the Wheelie Podcast. I'm your host, Micah Toll, and I'm joined by Electrek Seth Weintraub. How's it going, Seth? I'm good. Awesome. And we have a pile of new e-bike and e-scooter and e-moto and other interesting light EV stories to go through from the past week. It's quite a uh, diverse offering this week. We've got um, some interesting news about Harley Davidson's e-bikes being sold off, some um, big e-bike philanthropy projects, uh, working undercover as an e-bike delivery rider. Uh, we found a guy towing his boat to the sea using an electric scooter, so that's pretty interesting. Uh, we're going to have some uh, reviews coming up, and uh, then a couple electric motorcycle stories from uh, Rivid and Kawasaki for finishing it off with an interesting little Japanese key car coming to the U.S. So where are we going to start this week, Seth? All right. Harley Davidson's e-bike company sold off in surprise deal planning U.S. production. This is uh, kind of strange news on a few fronts. So um, Serial One is the electric bike company that Harley Davidson started. It was spun out from an uh, inside project at Harley, and they've been operating for what, like three, three and a half years or something now. Um, so they've been going pretty strong, but we just learned that the company has been acquired. So it's um, no longer owned, or at least not majority owned by Harley anymore. It got bought by a company called LEV Manufacturing that's based in Florida. Uh, and they, they had some help from a VC group, it appears. And it looks like they're going to try to move the brand stateside instead of manufacturing in Taiwan anymore. They want to build in Florida. I think in, um, not, not sure exactly, I think it's near like Hollywood, Florida, or a bit north of there. It's kind of a strange place for bicycle manufacturing. But that's the goal here. We don't know too much about the deal. Um, we know that LEV does currently produce electric bikes. You're seeing some of them there on the screen if you're watching that are more like cruisery style. And they're more of a low cost company, uh, at least compared to serial ones. So most of their bikes are in sort of the under $2,000 range. And so what they're saying is that they're gonna be able to produce these serial one bikes at a more competitive price. So if what they're saying is true, we could see prices drop on some of these uh, three and a half to five thousand dollar Harley bikes, though they're not going to be Harleys anymore. Of course, it was if it was that easy, we'd see a lot more e bike manufacturing in the U.S. So this is going to be an interesting one to watch. I'm not saying they can't do it. It sounds like they already assemble bikes uh, for their own brand, but uh, these are, are obviously much nicer, much more specialized bikes that have been designed through Serial One. So uh, I don't know, Seth. What, what do you think is going to happen here? Well, you know. I, I kind of look at this from the, the, the Harley side, like there, there's been some tumult there. Like, uh, you know, like I don't want to, you know, kind of bash the company because they have made some uh, moves into electrification, but I have to also kind of acknowledge that the, the strategy keeps to changing like from year to year. Um, you know, they were very excited about their, you know, uh, e-bike ideas. They had some really cool prototypes um and you know and and now it's you know they're just kind of pushing the serial one to the side um and then of course uh they've created their own live wire brand and and they've kind of spun that out a little bit like i, I kind of wonder if we'll see a similar thing with like live wire being sold off i mean i know it's kind of a separate entity already um i just think that I just have to imagine that, you know, somewhere in some Harley boardroom in Milwaukee, there's a fight between like the young guys and the old guys. And the old guys are like, you know, we're making hogs and, you know, that's where our, we made money since, you know, whatever. And, and the new guys are like, but, you know, like we have to do, we have to evolve and we have to make new stuff and we have to do cool stuff. And it's, it's to me, that's kind of what I see from the outside. Um, as far as the serial one, um, if they can get the price down, that would be fantastic. Um, I loved, uh, every ride I've taken on any serial one bike. I think they're fan, you know, they're, they're great bikes. Unfortunately, they are at a price point that it's like, hmm, you know, like you have to like really think about it. You have to really want one of these things that I think we usually see them at around $5,000, um, or more. And, you know, they're kind of like class 
class one or I think there's a class three as well. So, um, you know, from that side, I'm a little bit disappointed in Harley not kind of seeing this through. But, you know, if this new company can build them in the U.S. and, uh, you know, does a good job, clearly they have a good marketing team because they have uh, the short, short ladies uh, <laughs> uh, working the uh, the bikes over there. So I don't know. We'll see. I, I don't. Uh, I don't know what to make of this yet. I think uh, definitely a wait and see approach, but I do have to say I'm a little disappointed that uh, you know Harley's not seeing this through. Yeah, it's definitely one to watch. Though you make a good point with Livewire there. I mean, they're they're definitely investing heavily in bringing Livewire to profitability, which it's tough right now. But I mean, the whole electric vehicle space, especially in the motorcycle market, which lags about a decade behind the automotive market. Mm -hmm. So they're they're putting a lot of effort in there, and it could be that you know they just they couldn't babysit too many light electric vehicle cars at the same time. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move on here. Uh, electric e-bikes rose to the top of sales, and now they are giving it all away. Yeah, this is like you know one of those stories that we need right now, like it's just a feel-good story. And so I was excited to report on this uh, electric e-bikes. They're uh, one of the top selling e-bike companies in the US, they actually have the top selling model, the Electric XP 3.0, and they're known as a budget brand. They got there by selling decent bikes at a really good price. They've got two models under a thousand dollars. And so, you know, they've really risen up uh, through the uh, the market to, to the top now. And what they're trying to set as an example is not just designing a business that, you know, makes a good profit, but being a company that actually gives that back. So I was interviewing the CEO and he was talking to me about, um, you know, how he's always been interested in conscious capitalism, which is about, you know, a company has to, to make a profit, but that it shouldn't be purely profit driven, and that there should be, you know, ethical considerations in that as well. And so what I've is that electric is actually leading the industry, not just leading, but like dominating in terms of their philanthropy wing. And so this year alone, They've given over a million dollars in bikes to charities and then another over a million dollars in cash donations to other charities, um, both in the U.S. and around the world. They've partnered a lot with uh, Beast Philanthropy, which is uh, Mr. Beast's philanthropy program. And so they've brought uh, e-bikes to Africa, to communities that um, have been using pedal bikes to carry hundreds of pounds of water every day from a, a faraway water source to their village. Um, they've uh, done solar projects in Colombia, and so they've gone to a lot of you know far-reaching corners of the world that that don't have access to to clean water and electricity uh, and internet. They've brought in internet to some of these like island nations, uh, but even closer to home, um, they've they've done a lot of projects with donating bikes, donating company time. Um, the there's a picture of the CEO himself in Kenya putting together bikes for people. So it, it was just a really cool story to see that. You know, electric, they're really trying to lead the industry in terms of um, being a, a quality, low-cost bike provider. But more important than that is is not just sort of like resting on that dominance, but trying to promote this idea of, of companies giving back in the e-bike industry as well. And uh, part of the idea of giving it away was this year on, on Giving Tuesday, which is right after Cyber Monday, um, every bike they sold, they donated 100% of the revenue to charitable projects, um, which I thought was just incredible. Like, you know, they didn't make a dollar off of bikes that day. They actually lost money, um, you know, from the bikes that they sold that they had to buy. So um, I just think it's, it's incredible to see a company that's, you know, giving millions and millions of dollars every year to charitable projects when obviously they don't have to, you know, it, there's marketing uh, value there as well. But, um, you know, there's no one else that they're really competing against in the giving space in the in the e-bike market. So this sort of warms my heart to see a company that actually cares this much about it. Yeah, they seem to be uh, really like a solid group of folks. Um, I'm always like a little, I guess I'm jaded from from the past, but like, you know, <laughs> FTX kind of stuff. I'm always worried like, oh, it's a front and they're covering up, you know, drug money or you know something like that but they seem like really good guys the bikes are solid for the price um you know i, I saw a couple uh people say on on you just scrolling past twitter i think or um 
threads or something that uh, a couple of people just got their electric bikes on a Mr. Beast giveaway. So they're clearly providing um, some some bikes to his uh, audience. And obviously there's a marketing component to that. And there's a marketing component to the story here as well. But, um, you know, hopefully it's a, a good example for, for other companies to, uh, you know, spend spend some uh, money on good marketing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also, you know, they, they probably could have given away $100,000 and in free bikes and, and donations and had some marketing. So, you know, they'd have to give out $2 million in, in free bikes. And that, that's a good donations. point. Yeah, it's a significant amount. All right, moving on. I took my e-bike and went undercover as a food delivery rider. Here's what I learned. Yes, this was a fun, a fun sort of personal project for me because I report a lot on delivery riders and e-bikes are, are probably the dominant form of, of uh, delivery by bike these days. But, um, you know, I, I wanted to get that firsthand experience of what it's actually like. And so I actually signed up for DoorDash and I did a day of food delivery myself to really see what it's like to put yourself uh, in their bike shoes. Uh, the bike I used here is actually an electric e-bike. It's the XP 3.0. Uh, the company from our past story, which is kind of ironic, and I didn't mean to line it up that way, but it's nice it works. Uh, but I learned a lot about this whole process. Um, for one thing, it's a lot harder work than I expected. I like riding bikes, you know, I've got no problem working outdoors, but um, there is a lot of extra pressure here. It's not just like go to the restaurant, get the food, and ride it to somebody. The, the app is giving you like unrealistic timetables, so a lot of people are encouraged to break traffic rules to try and get there on time based on when the app is trying to tell people, you know, have to deliver the food. It's really hard to find a lot of these addresses. They give you a obscure address, which oftentimes isn't even the right place because if they're in a hotel or something, it's not accurate. So you got to call the people, you got to find them. And you're making peanuts. Some of these orders I was making like three and a half dollars to go get someone's food, find them and deliver it. You know, that's uh, maybe 20, 25 minutes of effort. So you're talking like, six seven dollars an hour but there are times when you're sitting around for half an hour waiting for an order so in total i spent about four and a half hours doing doordash delivery and i made i think 48 dollars, which is uh works out to something like less than 12 dollars an hour and to me that's just like i mean first of all it's lower than minimum wage in many states and it's it's just probably not a livable wage for most people unless you live in a super uh, low cost living area so it was very interesting to sort of see the perspective, realize how hard this work is, and then consider that uh, for a lot of people, this is their only form of income. So when you start talking about, you know, uh, limiting the type of bikes they can use, uh, putting more restrictions on bike riders and that sort of thing, like you, you got to sort of consider where they're coming from. The other thing that I, I learned is how important tips are. So I always yeah. tip my delivery riders, but now I tip even better because of that, I think $48 I made, over half of it actually came from tips. Um, it was only like 20 something that, that came from DoorDash actually paying me to deliver orders, which is crazy that, you know, tips make up that much. I assume that, you know, I didn't think they got paid great, but I assume that, you know, the majority of their money is actually coming from the service that, that hires them here. But no, that's, that's not the case. So make sure you're, you're tipping your delivery rider. Um, I know when it's raining out or something like that, I tip even better because this is not easy work that they're doing. Yeah, I uh, I had no idea how low the the pay was, um, and like kind of makes me a little upset with DoorDash because you know they're taking a cut and they're setting the prices. I feel like uh, I mean you know m maybe this is like an all out scrum for market share right now, and then you know further on down the line uh, they'll give their riders. But I mean, you know you're you're making below minimum wage. I feel like that that's not sustainable. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think part of it is sort of like, a, you know, corporate preying on people that don't have their option. There's right. something to be said for like, you know, you can do DoorDash for a couple hours uh, on your own schedule, that sort of thing. It's like an independent contractor. So you accept an order whenever you want. You don't have to accept any you don't. So there are right. you know, some advantages over like, Working the window at McDonald's, for example. But right. yeah, I mean the the actual pay here is, is awful. A lot of people did tell me that um, you know once you do this for more than a day, like I did, 
you get better at uh, being choosy with the orders you accept. I just accepted everything. So I guess most people would not say, all right, I'll pick up McDonald's for $3 kind of thing. So what happens if you don't accept it? Like, how, like I'm not that familiar with DoorDash. I don't, I don't think I've ever used it. Yeah, so because they use this independent cr contractor system to make you not an employee, um, mm -hmm. They can't force you to do an order, so you can just you know not accept an offer. And they kind of imply that if you don't have any offers, they'll give you fewer. Um, so I'm not sure what the legal you know ramifications are there in terms of their um, their system. Right. But it seems like it's very common for dashers to be choosy and just wait for the the higher paying orders. And I also learned from people that do this that um, they believe that DoorDash tends to prioritize car drivers. And so lots of times as a bike rider, you're getting the offers that uh, car delivery drivers already uh, um, refuse to accept. Interesting. Wow. Door dashing McDonald's. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, the fascinating and I, experience. And I bet the, the tips on a McDonald's door dash are not good. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, in fact, uh, I when I order food, I usually tip in cash because I worry that the app is going to like take some of it. Or they'll use part of it towards their pay, or right. you know they'll pay taxes even on you know a few bucks. But uh, no one tips cash in like the dozen or so deliveries I did. The people that did tip did it through the app, which I guess yeah. is easier. That's, it does make me wonder how much they skim off because you know I mean DoorDash says I got this much tip, but who knows you know? Yeah, and then of course Uncle Sam also takes their cut. So yeah, uh, uh, that's that's uh, I have to say I'm a little bit disappointed about that. Um, but yeah. you know, thanks for showing us what we're looking at here. And, uh, if I do get a DoorDash, I'm going to make sure I tip pretty well, especially if it's a biker. Yeah. Yeah. They, they do hard on this work. They deserve it. All right. Let's move on here. Who needs a truck man tows boat with a tiny electric scooter? Yeah, this is a kick scooter, even not like a Vespa scooter. Um, this was on the news in Australia, went a, a bit viral. Of course, it's Australia, uh, where a guy is towing what looks like, I don't know, a 10, 12 foot John boat uh, behind a standing electric scooter, like a, a line type scooter. It seems to be a, a consumer one. Um, but basically, he just tied it to himself. I guess he tied the trailer with a belt to his waist, which highly not recommended like the definition of do not try this at home kids but um i guess it was pretty flat and he towed it like five miles from his home to the um local beach and that's how he like puts his boat in which you know is just partly kind of a funny story we've occasionally seen other instances of people towing boats with scooters but also it highlights just how effective and versatile some of this micro mobility is like you know a lot of people think you need a truck if you want to take a 10, 12 foot boat out to the beach, but it's entirely possible that a much smaller electric vehicle, like a scooter can do the job. Now, obviously if you have big Hills that you need to either go up and you need the motor power or go down and you need the brakes, then this is probably not the best scenario. But in this case, if you live near the coast and it's pretty flat, I mean, literally like a, you know, 300, $400 cheap electric scooter can, can do the job. So, it's, it's kind of a funny story on the one hand, but it does highlight just how versatile and effective very small light electric vehicles can be. Um, I'm not sure I would tow a, a boat like this with a scooter. I don't know about you, Seth. First of all, I think you definitely would. I, <laughs> I know you, Micah, and I, I think I, I'm actually surprised that that's not you doing the pulling right there. Um, I also, uh, you know, like they have very light boats. Um, my father-in-law's got a uh, little sailboat thing that he he actually tows around himself, like he like walks it out onto the beach. So I guess this this you know makes sense. It's not it's a lot smaller than the thing that this guy's pulling around, but um, yeah, I mean it makes perfect sense. Anything that you do on your you know walking can be done with a scooter, can be helped to be done with a scooter, and I think this is a pretty good use case. Like like maybe uh scooter trailers should have like or sorry trailers should have scooters built into them or you know the mechanism to do something like that um further along in the story um there's a great picture of a guy with one of those uh mobility scooters <laughs> pulling up a huge boat and i can't even tell if this is real or not because it seems hilarious and there there's even like a rollerblader that looks like he's towing 
<laughs> in the second picture, which makes it even more hilarious. But um, yeah, why not? Like uh, all these things work uh, pretty well. Um, you know, they, these are high torque little electric motors. Why not use them in, in the uh, trailer hauling area? I kind of feel like that, um, you know, in inventory work, when you have these like big boxes, there's a lot of those like self-powered, um, uh, you know, uh, pallet lifter parts. things. Yeah. Kind of, kind of feel like they're in the same neighborhood as this, but I'm all for it. Uh, obviously if you hurt yourself, it's not my fault, but, uh, <laughs> otherwise you're good. Yeah. It's fun to see just how effective some of these things can be. Yeah, for sure. All right, moving on. Uh, this one's mine. Uh, Van Powers Urban Glide Ultra going Dutch for Black Friday. So uh, Van Powers is, uh, you know, they, they sent me a um, an offer to review this bike. Um, you know, I, I, I'm kind of out of my commuter bike is a, um, a 2017 Rally Redux IE with a Broza motor that um, the belt broke in the in the motor and I haven't gotten around to fixing it yet. So I was like, oh, this is this would kind of fill that niche, um, and it did. Um, so Van Power sent me the uh, Urban Glide Ultra. Um, specs on it are pretty um, simple here. Uh, big battery, 690 watt hour, not huge, but but big. Uh, probably the standout feature is it's got a Bufang M600, um, and you know they say it's a 500 watt nominal mid drive motor. But torque sensor, uh, we know that people have taken, specifically Luna, have taken the M600 and put I don't know like three three kilowatts through it, um, and you know it doesn't burn up too quickly. So it has a lot of power. Um, sadly, uh, Van Powers uh, kind of didn't put a huge controller on this. So um, it's still, and, and, and actually the controller is fine, but um, they cut it off at class one, which is 20 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and this thing has like so much more power. So like, you know, I would be pedaling and I, you know, I always ride in the highest pedal assist mode and um, I would go, you know, zero to 20, like really quick. And then right at 20, it would just be like this cutoff. Yeah. And then I would, you know, go down to 19 and then it would power up again and then off and on and off and on and off and on. And that's on a flat. Um, so, you know, that that's a little bit frustrating to me. And I called them up and I was like, you got a great bike here. Um, tell me how to unlock it so I can go 28 miles per hour. And they're like, doesn't do it. Uh, <laughs> so I was like, all right, fine. Uh, so... I, I use this for my daily commute for a week. Um, it's fantastic going up hills. The Bafang M600 uh, is a great, uh, you know, high torque um, motor. This has got a torque sensor in it. Um, and they're selling the whole thing for $2,000. I can't tell if it's still Black Friday price. But I guess I could click through and find out. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's a solid, solid deal. Um Yeah, and you bikes. have on your your commute um, fairly lack of bike lanes, right? How do you feel riding in the street with this bike? Yeah, so that's the problem. Like, I love the fact that I can go 28 miles per hour on Class 3 e-bikes, and this one um, does not go that fast. So it, at 20 miles per hour, I do feel a little um, – uh, it went up a little bit in price. Um, I do feel a little bit uh, susceptible to to cars, like, going around me. And, you know, it's super frustrating because the bike has the power. It's just they made a, a, a pretty low cutoff. Um, other yeah. specs on it. It is a little heavy at 70 pounds for a, a commuter bike. Um, I probably would have, uh, you know, it's it's a solid bike. It's got a step over frame. So they put a lot of weight into that, that joint there, that big joint that, you know, the front and back half of the bike have to kind of go through this one little area. Yeah. Um, but it is a little bit heavy. I, you know, looking at this bike, I would say, hey, this is probably a 55 pound bike and it's, you know, 15 pounds heavier. It's got a big battery, obviously. Um, one nice thing is um, the suspension is not, you know, a lot of a lot of cheap Chinese 
bike companies put the worst suspension on a bike possible and just to say that it has suspension the suspension actually works it works well um and then they have uh, a zoom uh, seat post uh suspension that also works really well so it was a very smooth ride um as i said in the review i think um the the tires were a little bit um uh unimpressive uh I think they're Ken does. Uh, I would have loved to seen uh, Schwalbe Big Ben's on there, like on my other bike. Um, Tektro brakes, so no no complaints about the brakes at all. Um, nice bright display. Um, a lot of just a lot of really good solid features for a two thousand dollar bike. And those um, are hydraulic brakes too, right? Yeah, hydraulic uh, Tektro brakes. Um, a solid derailleur. Um, I saw it's a nine speed. That looks like a micro shift. Yeah. Yeah. Nine, nine speed micro shift. Um, you know, range, they, you know, they of course said 65 to 70 miles. Um, if you're going, you know, full pedal assist, um, you, you might get up to 40 miles, uh, depending on how much leg you put into it. Um, which is still, you know, a solid uh, commute range probably go a couple of days between charges. Uh, one thing I didn't like, um, so it did have a four amp uh, charger, which is nice. Um, usually the default is a two amp charger, something like that um, at 48 volts. Uh, but it does have a proprietary, I don't know, have you seen this uh, connector, Ben? Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, Micah? Yeah, once in a while, that is annoying. So yeah, I mean, if, if you need to buy a new... Uh, charger it's going to be this and then of course um the charge port and the power button are at the bottom of the uh down tube which is like you know it's not a huge deal but like every time you charge it up you have to kind of you know reach way down and um it could be easier yeah, so a lot of people are getting a step through bike specifically because they have slight mobility issues so it would have been right. nice to see that located high yeah so um Lots of good things about the bike. It had a bright uh, uh, front light. Um, like again, the suspension is good. The uh, the back um, rack is very solid. Um, loud bell, uh, just all around solid bike. But um, you know, a few things that I think they could work on for version two. And and Van, Van Powers um, is a you know kind of Chinese e bike conglomerate that includes a lot of brands that uh, we've heard of in the past like Antier and some other like lower quality stuff. So it's really kind of refreshing to see a higher quality bike come out of that. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's great to see more of those, you know, mid-level options as opposed to just, you know, a pile of, of budget options. At 2000 that was a crazy price. At, at $24.99, it's, it's still interesting because it looks like they did a nice job with this bike. Yeah, and, you know, like this is clearly a Dutch style e-bike and you know we i did some research on van powers and i saw that they tried to label this bike or call this bike the gazelle previously oh. <laughs> uh, so i'm sure that didn't go over well in the netherlands um but like you know if you're looking for a dutch style e-bike you know you're looking at the gazelles and they, those typically start around 3500 so you know you're saving a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks by going with this and you're not losing you're you're not missing out on much so, um, yeah, I just thought that was, that was interesting about this bike. Yeah. But we should... the... Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, and the gazelles actually go up, you know, significantly from three and a half starting. I think some of those are like hot motor bikes and you get into the, you know, nicer Bosch ones that they, they can be, you know, four or five easily. Yep. All right. Uh, America's latest low cost commuter electric motorcycles expand deliveries. Yeah, this is the uh, Rivet Anthem, which is a very interesting electric motorcycle. It's in some ways I see it as kind of the antithesis to the Saunders Metacycle. Um, it's also an electric motorcycle startup, but um, it came from a team that was well versed with motorcycles um, that have worked in and ridden their entire lives, and they came in with a different funding strategy to be completely funded from outside sources before. Um, producing the bikes as opposed to the Metacycle, which famously sort of funded each uh, follow-on round with the pre-orders of the previous round. So um, 
I, b- I believe yeah. that's called a pyramid scheme. <laughs> um, so uh, it's great to see that the Rivet Anthem here is is not only um, starting deliveries, which I think they did back in September, but they're really ramping up to uh, across the country now. So they've got bikes going out um, in probably you know half the states in the U.S., but to every corner. You know, they're in Washington, they're in Florida, uh, they're in California. The ones in California apparently being delivered by the team themselves, which is pretty cool. I met some of them, including the founder, and just you know, real great guys. Um, the, uh, the founders, um, he's like, super into engineering and he comes from a gas motorcycle background and automotive as well. Apparently when he was in college, he like rebuilt a car in his dorm room. Um, so like he's one of these, you know, tinkering kind of guys that um, over time got into electrics and they've just designed a really cool electric motorcycle. Um, one of the neat things here, we're looking at the battery. If you're watching the, the feed with us, it's a removable four and a half kilowatt hour battery. Um, it's pretty heavy. I think it's something like 80 pounds because it's got a built-in charger. Um, but to make sure you don't have to actually lift that 80 pounds, it's got four wheels under it. And so it's low down um, with like a fulcrum so you don't have to hold the entire weight and you roll it around. Uh, you can see here a woman sort of riding the battery. Uh, if you give it a bit of a push, it's powered. So you do have to use the, the fold-up trolley handle to, to actually drag it around. But this way, if you live in an apartment, you can park down on the street and then just roll your battery into the elevator and uh, head up if you're in like a you know, brownstone or something. Wait, you are you saying the, the wheels are powered? No, no, they're not powered, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Someone just pushed her for this cool shot. Okay, okay. I was going to say yeah, that. No. That would be crazy. Yeah, no, she's just like Newton's Laws and that, uh, that battery right. there. <laughs> um, so it's not powered. That would be very cool. Um, <laughs> they actually joked about like maybe we should uh, find a way to make these wheels powered. But um, it is like a very nicely designed battery in that it's uh, removable without tools. That was another um, criticism of the Metacycle was that they said it'd be a removable battery, but you need like two different tools to unbolt it. So um, a really cool design. Uh, it started at like $7,800, which was um, a pretty good deal for a 75 mile an hour, 75 mile range bike. Now it's up to, I think, um, 8,900, which is a little pricier, but it's a very nicely designed bike. It's got some other cool features like the seat actually moves up and down with an actuator uh, by about four inches. So not only can you share the bike with you know friends and family that are of different sizes, but even while you're riding, you can adjust the seat height. So you know you can have it up higher while you're riding so that you're a little more comfortable, your legs aren't as cramped. But when you get to a red light, if you're shorter, you can just drop the seat down so you can flat foot it uh, at the stops. So just like really interesting innovations that are designed into this bike. And it's cool to see them um, shipping, you know, nationwide and really ramping up the the sales and deliveries now. So, uh, you know, my, my hat's off to the, the Rivet team. And what kind of like numbers do they, or do you anticipate them selling? I mean, obviously, you know, low cost e-bikes, sorry, low cost motorcycles are, are in high demand, but you know, with, with all the Saunders, uh, folks looking for rides, uh, yeah. what do you think um, these guys can put out? It's a good question. It's hard to say. Most of these companies don't want to share exact numbers in the beginning because it gives a lot of insight into their financials. The most mm-hmm. I've seen in any of their um, pictures or videos, because they, they share a lot on social media, is I've seen trailers with like um, 20 or 30 bikes in them at a time. So, you know, they're not just like doing ones and twos in their garage kind of thing. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, they are assembled in the U.S., which is a pretty cool thing. Obviously, lots of, you know, foreign made parts, but final assembly in the U.S., um, but I don't think they're doing, you know, like uh, hundreds of these at a time either. So they're, they're still very much in the, in the early stages. But uh, uh, I think, you know, if they do hundreds of units in the first year, then they could be positioned for thousands of units in the second year. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, and they're pretty good looking bikes too. Uh, that, you know, it's it's a little bit, takes a little bit to get used to the kind of the overhanging battery. But right. um, yeah, I think they look pretty solid. Yeah, there's there's some real engineering in here that I think um, you know deserves some uh, some credit. Totally. All right, let's move on. Uh, all right, another motorcycle. Uh, closer look at Kawasaki's new electric motorcycles, the Ninja E1 and Z E1. These I saw recently at the uh, Milan Motorcycle Show. Uh, my first time seeing them in the flesh here, so uh, I was able to get these up close uh, pictures of them. We've known the specs for a little while now. They're not very impressive. I would say the best thing about the bike is the way that they look. Um, you know, Kawasaki obviously has a, a storied history 
in um, motorcycle design. And so it's great to see that they've, um, you know, built some, some nice looking bikes here. This is the Ninja, which is their fared version. And then they have the Z E1, which is like their sort of um, naked street bike. Uh, the, the downside here though, is that the performance is just really poor. Um, they're like at best 125 CC equivalent. The batteries are like 3.2 kilowatt hours. I want to say there's two removable batteries. So quite small, um, maybe 50% smaller than the not giant battery we just saw on the rivet. And um, the range is, is pretty poor considering. Uh, I think it's something like um, 30 something miles at higher speeds. So, you know, this really? is very much going to be an urban commuter bike, something that you'd use just in the city. Uh, the speeds that it gets up to, there's a boost button to get it into, I think, the, the 50s, but I think it mostly cruises in like the high 40s miles an hour. So obviously not a highway bike. It's it's almost strange to see like a Kawasaki Ninja that you can't take on the highway. It's just like, it doesn't compute in a way. But um, this is, of course, Kawasaki's first stab at electric motorcycles. So on the one hand, I want to commend them for finally doing something. They're the first of the big four from Japan to actually put out a full-size electric motorcycle. Um, but the performance here is just like, so muted that I think it's going to be hard to find the right audience. It's really limited to like purely urban only riding, which is a real use case. There are people that live in a city and they just want to be able to like ride around the city. Um, it's not that there isn't a rider for this bike, but it's, it's very limited. Uh, the upside though, is that they're fairly affordable. They start in the low 7,000s. I think it's like 7,300 um, for the um, uh, Kawasaki Z. So, you know, they're not super expensive. You compare that to a zero, zero start at like 12,000 now. So reasonable ish, uh, obviously more expensive than a combustion equivalent, but as, as far as the electric motorcycle market goes, you know, they're not, they're not gouging. I'm not spending a lot of money on batteries either, <laughs> but right. uh, reasonable ish for the electric market, I would say. All right. So I'm going to adorn the uh, tinfoil hat here. And <laughs> it, is this, something that like the the gas motor folks at kawasaki are like all right you want an electric vehicle all right we'll make you an electric vehicle and it's gonna suck and you're gonna hate it i mean i kind of feel like why not just make one that has i mean it's very easy to have a lot more power in an electric motorcycle i mean are they try? was it to keep the cost down I, that's the only reason i only legitimate reason i can see for not making this a more powerful bike especially with the ninja brand yeah, it's, it's a bit of a head scratcher. I think that, I mean, they've just gotten such a, a late start on this compared to other other companies that I think they're trying to start, you know, small and something they can manage. Um, I mean, it, it, it could be a bit of a tinfoil hat situation where they just don't want to actually create demand for an electric motorcycle, so they built something no one wants. I don't think that's what happened here. Um, because, I mean, like we know Japan, if, if they didn't want to build electric vehicles, they just wouldn't build electric vehicles, right? right. Like, um, it's, it's kind of in the culture. So the fact that they're even doing this, I think, shows that they see it as a future. I just think that they're not, like they've started so late that they're not prepared to, to catch up to companies like Energica, Zero, um, Harley-Davidson even, in terms of, of power and performance yet. Yeah, and I mean... You know, like I don't typically ask this about motorcycles, but are these upgradable? Like, could you get put a bigger battery pack in there? Not really. You're basically uh, stuck with what what you got here. Um, obviously, in terms of customizations and stuff, there's uh, you know a, a big part of the motorcycle industry is, is cosmetic uh, modifications. But in terms right. of the, the power and performance, I don't think there's going to be a lot you can do here um, without you know voiding your warranty. Obviously, if if you want to go nuts and you're in your workshop you can start swapping motors that kind of stuff but right that's a stock bike um but that is one thing to point out that in terms of you know you do warranty you do service support from Kawasaki. this isn't like buying from a startup that you know this is a real motorcycle brand so there's something to be said there as well yeah all right well slightly disappointing but uh good to see nonetheless and uh speaking of uh japanese tiny vehicles we have a solar powered Japanese tiny van puzzle unveiled ahead of North American sales. 
This one really excites me. Um, if you're familiar with key cars, uh, KEI, it's this like small automotive category in Japan where they make sort of like I don't know, half size, three quarter size vehicles that fit into their own little regulatory scheme. And they're not very common in the US because they generally don't meet US um, car regulations. But we're seeing a little bit more of this key car design coming to the US. And this is a company that is intending to bring these um, by 2025. So they just debuted these in the US as a, like, this is the vehicle, here's what to expect from us in a couple of years. And it's a really neat design. They already make these in Japan, so it's not like a concept, um, but this is their new version. And it's, um, it's going to be more for commercial customers. This is basically like a panel van, you know, just a bit smaller. So it only has two front seats. The rest is all cargo in the back. But it's got some interesting Japanese-inspired touches to it, um, largely focused on disaster response. So from the outside, there's basically like uh, power station style plugs. So you, know, you can roll up to somewhere that lost power and people can just like plug right into the like, fender of the van to get C or USB power. Um, there's a first aid kit that's accessible from the outside of the vehicle as well. And uh, it comes with a uh, company produced crowbar. So like, I guess in an earthquake situation, which again, you know, common in, uh, in Japan, you've got tools right there for like disaster recovery. So stuff you don't normally see in an electric vehicle or any like, you know, consumer or even a lot of commercial electric vehicles, but interesting Japanese inspired features here that, um, you know, might be nice to have in something that you would turn into like a, maybe a camper or like a, you know, van life type electric vehicle. Uh, because it is a key car, it's not an LSV, like a low speed vehicle. So it's probably going to come in with higher speeds. A lot of these go, you know, 40, 50, maybe 60 miles an hour with the tailwind kind of thing. <laughs> so uh, this, you know, isn't going to be limited to 25 mile an hour, um, depending how they bring it in. So it could be interesting as a small commercial vehicle. And uh, you never know, like when, when you might need a crowbar. Exactly. I saw the crowbar and I was like, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I used a crowbar the other day. My uh, uh, my neighbor in the in our apartment building got stuck in the elevator. Uh, his dog leash got caught in the door. He was in there for like half an hour. And when I found oh him, I was gosh. like, "Wait, I have a crowbar." It was the first time I've ever like used the crowbar in my apartment. Yeah, you just yeah. Uh, usually have to wave it around when and no. <laughs> um, so this this thing is awesome. I love key cars. Um, I wish more of them were electric. This is. Um, this is such a cool looking little weird mobile that, uh, and, but I could see it being useful too. Like, uh, I mean, the, the wheels don't look big enough to like take a big pottle pottle in the U S but, um, it just seems like such a useful little vehicle, um, you know, for campuses kind of where gems, uh, operate, uh, you know, obviously with the sliding door, big, big, uh, space in the back could be utilized for, um, you know, taking stuff around uh, an enclosed you know. space, you know, like yeah. the gem, it's, it's kind of like a, unless you get the more expensive enclosed ones, which are, you know, uh, like thousands of dollars more with this, it's not a golf cart. It's like fully enclosed, like a, like a delivery van. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, out in, in weather, for instance, or, you know, uh, just, you like know, theft. It, it, yeah. theft. Yeah. Like yeah, they keep packages cold. in there. Yeah, I, I think it's a well way underserved market. Um, I'd love to see these uh, around. The fact that they might go highway speeds, that's super interesting. I don't know how I'd feel about taking a, a, a turn at highway speeds in this thing, but uh, you know, theoretically the batteries are down low. I love the fact that it has solar panels on top. Um, you know, just sitting out in the sun probably doesn't have a huge battery. Uh, those panels probably add like a significant amount of range, especially if it's not being used a lot. So, and then of course, uh, having outlets uh, for other stuff, emergency situations, pretty pretty awesome. Uh, do we know how much it's gonna cost to get one of these over here? No, there's a lot of details that uh, just haven't been released yet. So pricing, even things like, you know, speed and such, um, we don't really know yet, so. Uh... A lot of the most interesting details we're still waiting for. They've, they've got a few years to figure that out because they're aiming for a 2025 U.S. launch. 
I, I think we need to review this, man. Yeah. Like we need to be like on the forefront because I, I think this is a, a cool little category and maybe, it, you yeah. know, like this coming to the U S bring others as well. And, uh, Theoretically, Japan will get around to electrifying their their key car fleet, which, by the way, are all awesome. Like, I just love all those little cars. They're so cool. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's a real place for that kind of stuff in you know urban and suburban applications. I, I don't know, like you said, I, I don't know if this will go highway speeds or if I'd want it to. But having a, a small urban vehicle that you can even go you know forty five miles an hour for when you're on a bigger road is a is a big advantage. All right, let's uh, hit the comments. Uh, we got a, a bunch from uh, TLL. Um, catching up on the LEV and the Harley Convo, lots of faith in the LEV leadership to take on this new tech level for their rental and entry level fleet. That's right, they do uh, rental stuff. Uh, that is a good um, revenue stream. Um, so didn't think about that. Harley obviously doesn't have their own uh, rental stuff. So the fact that that's built in might be a good good thing. Um, excited to get my new Ejo Ace. Um, I had an Ejo way back in the day, a folder. It was pretty good. For me, that urban bike under 55 pounds that can go on a bus and train easily and go 20 miles per hour with your thumb in the deep south is awesome. Yeah, I'd. That's that's the dream, man. <laughs> In an urban environment, the speed limit is 35. is so much more safe in reality and perception, especially off the E-line. All right. Suspensions are worth it. Two things I look for in a rigid fork. Re Recyclery are most common to clamp PVC tubes in the fork to make it a rigid fork. Okay. So uh, he asked about the manufacturer selling replacement chargers in the Van Powers bike. Um, they do... Um, and they cost about $130. Whoa. Um, yeah, a little pricey. So uh, I would, So what, what I've done in the past, uh, so you know, just specifically the Rally Redux IE has one of those magnet, uh, I can't remember what they're called, like rose, roses. Yeah, it's like a German something. Yeah, yeah. So it's a great connector, and it's probably the, you know, it's, it's like Apple's MagSafe, basically for for e-bikes but uh the controller broke uh the uh sorry the charger broke so i was like oh crap what am i gonna do so i just took i have like you know obviously i have a bunch of juiced bikes um i took one of the juiced uh you know 52 volt uh chargers cut it and then cut the cut the, the charger and then just connected the uh the power lines and uh you know it doesn't look great but uh it charges just fine so <laughs> um maybe that's the solution here uh you know theoretically like why not just make a, a, a universal charger that would be nice yeah, michael to... why don't you start an e-bike company or design one with a manufacturer it's a good question we should do something like that yeah there's something to be said for like being brand agnostic and that's true yeah we don't want to uh let's see uh here's a good question uh did you get to keep the container when you would uh when you got the electric earth moving equipment <laughs> yes yeah, so that's from a story that'll probably be in next week's uh podcast um i got a container full of uh, earth moving equipment so uh, a lot of people ask me if i got to keep the container it's not like an amazon package where you get to keep the box i had to buy the container so i do have it but it was not like thrown in free with the with the shipment and, and, I bought the and container. what are you going to do with the container um, actually today hopefully i'm going to be putting solar panels up on it and turn it into like a solar powered off-grid charging box for oh, uh, my my e-equipment yeah that's awesome yeah and, and, and another story we'll look forward to yeah it's gonna have ac and everything i mean it's the plan we'll see if it works all right e-bikes and scooters displace four times as much demand for oil as all the evs in the world but these motorcycles are a stretch and key in Japanese is pronounced K cars. Oh, is it really? Oh, that's what happens when you read words and you don't hear them. You know, in Japan, they, they had a different pronounce. It wasn't K. It was like somewhere between K and key. It was like Ka. K, Ka cars. Or I don't know. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, 
Oh, we have Run Horse EV Global saying, I am a low speed electric vehicle manufacturer. We'll have to check it out. And cool. finally, we have Bri the Bike Guy saying, Sup, guys, smash the like button. So if you're watching this on YouTube, yes, smash the like button. And more importantly, subscribe and all the other things. You want to take us out? Awesome. Just like Bree said. So, uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, it's great having you here. And we look forward to seeing you in uh, another two weeks for the next episode of the Wheelie Podcast.